Welcome to Brainish English Stories. Once upon a time, there was a man who might have been a bit crazy. Or maybe he was just really scared. Or perhaps, though I don't fully get it, he developed a new way of sensing things after going through lots of pain. Something led him to a strange place, and to him, everything there seemed the same. He told me part of the story, and I saw the last part with my own eyes. Chapter 1 Haldane and I were buddies even when we were in school. What made us friends was our shared dislike of a guy named Visker, who came from our hometown. His family knew ours, so when he arrived, they connected him with us. He was the worst person, both as a boy and a grown-up, that I've ever known. He never told lies, and that's a good thing. But he didn't stop there. If someone asked him if another guy had done something wrong, like leaving school grounds without permission, or doing some mischief, he'd always say, I don't know, sir, but I think so. He never really knew we made sure of that. But what he thought was always treated as true. I remember Haldane twisting his arm to find out how he knew about that cherry tree incident, and he just said, I don't know, I just feel sure. And I was right, you see. What do you do with a guy like that? We grew up into adults. At least Haldane and I did. Visker turned into a self-righteous person. He became a vegetarian, didn't drink alcohol, only wore all-natural fabrics, followed Christian science, and all the things that self-righteous people do. But he wasn't a typical self-righteous person. He knew things he shouldn't have known, things he couldn't have known in a normal way. It wasn't that he discovered things, he just knew them. Once, when I was very unhappy, he came to my place, we were in our last year at Oxford, and talked about things I hardly understood myself. That's actually why I decided to go to India that winter. Being unhappy was bad enough without that guy knowing all about it. I stayed in India for over a year. When I was coming back, I thought about how great it would be to see my old friend Haldane again. If I thought about Visker at all, I wished he didn't exist. But I didn't think about him much. I really wanted to see Haldane. He was always such a cheerful guy, kind, simple, honest, upright, and full of practical kindness. I really looked forward to seeing him, to see the happiness in his bright blue eyes, surrounded by wrinkles from laughing, to hear his cheerful laugh, and feel the firm grip of his large hand. I went straight from the docks to his place in Gray's Inn, and I found him looking pale, weak, with dull eyes, a limp handshake, and pale lips that smiled without real joy, and welcomed me without happiness. His place was a mess, with furniture and stuff half-packed. There were big boxes tied up, and boxes of books, ready to be sealed shut. Yes, I'm moving, he said. I can't stay in these rooms. There's something strange about them, something very strange. I'm leaving tomorrow. The room was getting dark as autumn set in. You received the furs, I mentioned, just to make conversation, because I noticed a big case containing them among the others. Furs, he said. Oh yes, thanks a lot. I almost forgot about the furs. He chuckled, maybe to be polite, because there wasn't anything funny about the furs. 
I had picked out the finest ones I could find, and I had seen them packed and shipped when my heart was heavy. He looked at me and said nothing. Come on, let's have dinner, I suggested as cheerfully as I could. Too busy, he replied after a brief pause and a quick look around the room. Look, I'm really glad to see you. If you could just go and order dinner, I'd go myself, but you see how it is. So, I went. And when I returned, he had cleared a space near the fireplace and moved his big dinner table there. We had dinner by candlelight. I tried to be funny, and I'm sure he tried to enjoy it, but we both failed. His tired eyes kept watching me all the time, except for those moments when he glanced back into the shadows around us without turning his head. After dinner, when the waiter had taken away the dishes, I looked at Haldane with concern, causing him to stop in the middle of a pointless story and give me a questioning look. What's wrong? I asked. You're not paying attention, he complained. What's the matter? That's what you should tell me, I said. He fell silent, giving a quick glance at the shadows, and then stooped to stoke the fire, probably trying to create a blaze that would light up every corner of the room. You're falling apart, I said cheerfully. What have you been up to? Wine. Cards. Gambling. A woman. If you won't tell me, you'll have to tell your doctor. Seriously, my friend, you're a wreck. You're a great friend to have around, he said and forced a smile that didn't look pleasant at all. I'm the friend you need right now, I replied. Do you think I'm blind? Something has gone wrong, and you've turned to something. Maybe morphine? And you've thought about it so much that you've lost perspective. Come on, tell me, old buddy. I bet it's not as bad as you think. If I could tell you or tell anyone it wouldn't be as bad as it is, he said slowly. If I could tell anyone, it would be you. And even as it is, I've told you more than I've told anyone else. I couldn't get anything more out of him. But he urged me to stay, even offering to give me his bed and sleep on the floor. However. I had already booked a room at the Victoria Hotel, and I was expecting some letters. So, I left him quite late, and he stood on the staircase, holding a candle over the railing to light my way down. When I returned the next morning, he was gone. Men were moving his belongings into a large van with pantechnican written in big letters on it. He hadn't left an address with the porter and had left in a cab with two suitcases, probably heading to Waterloo, according to the porter. Well, everyone has the right to keep their problems to themselves, if they want. And I had my own issues to deal with, which kept me busy. Chapter 2 More than a year later, I saw Haldane again. I had a place to stay in a place called the Albany. He came early one morning, even before we had breakfast. He looked very pale and thin, like a ghost. His face seemed worn out, and his hands were shaking like butterflies caught in a net. I greeted him warmly and offered him some breakfast. This time, I decided not to ask questions. I could tell he wanted to talk, so I waited for him to start. 
I'm going to end my life, he said. Don't worry, I won't do it right now. I'll do it when I can't take it anymore. But I want someone to know why. Can I trust you? I reassured him with a nod. Can you promise not to tell anyone what I'm about to say as long as I'm alive? He asked. I promised. He sat quietly, staring at the fire. Then he said, It's really hard to explain. You see, there's this man named George Visker. I nodded. Yes, I remember him. I heard he went to some faraway place to talk about not eating meat to people who eat other people. But he's gone now, so that's good. Haldane continued, Yes, he's gone, but not to preach. He's dead. Dead? I asked. Yes, he replied, not many people know, but he is. I asked, how did he die? Haldane explained, you know how nosy he always was, always knowing everything and wanting to have deep talks. Well, he interfered in my life, told someone a bunch of lies. Lies? I questioned. Actually, the things he said were true, but the way he said them made them sound like lies, he clarified. I didn't lie, but he guessed what was true. And he had no right to guess correctly. I nodded in understanding. Haldane went on, because of him, I lost someone I cared about, and she passed away. We weren't even friends anymore. I wanted to see her, but I couldn't. Then he showed up at her funeral. And when I returned to my room, he came to visit me. He must have been quite annoying, I commented. Did you kick him out? Haldane replied, No, I listened to what he had to say. He told me it was all for the best, but I lost my temper and tried to strangle him. I didn't know if I meant to kill him, but he ended up dead. And afterward, when I looked at him, I realized what I had done. I asked, so, what did you do next? Haldane said, I thought about it. He was planning to go away and no one knew where he was going. I was able to get rid of his body, so I wasn't too worried. But a year later, something strange happened. I was sitting in my chair and looked at the calendar. It had been exactly a year since that day. And I remembered what he had said about me not being able to get rid of the body. Did you believe him? I inquired. Haldane continued, at first, I didn't. I thought someone had moved his body to scare me. So, I checked the place where I had hidden him, but he was still there, just like I left him. It had only been a year. But then, something even stranger happened. I saw him again, this time in a train carriage. He looked the same, and I couldn't explain it. I threw him out in a tunnel. And if I see him again, I might take my own life, because I can't handle it. It's too much. He always knew things he shouldn't have known. But I'll end it before he gets the chance to scare me anymore. I promise I'm not crazy. I reassured him, I don't think you're crazy, my friend. But you're clearly very stressed. 
Maybe we can face this together and find a way to stop these strange thoughts. She was fond of me. We decided to stay together and confront whatever was troubling him, hoping to find a solution. Chapter 3 That's how we ended up traveling together. I was hopeful for him. He had always been a great friend, so sensible and strong. I couldn't believe that he had gone crazy, gone forever, I mean, so that he'd never come right again. Maybe my own troubles made it easy for me to see things not quite right. Anyway, I took him away to recover his mental health, just like I would have taken him away to get well after an illness. And the madness seemed to fade away, and in a month or two, we were really happy, and I thought I had helped him. And I was very glad because of our old friendship. We never talked about Visker. I thought he had forgotten all about him. I thought I understood how his mind, stressed by sorrow and anger, had focused on the man he didn't like and created a scary story around that nasty character. And I had overcome my own trouble. And we were as happy as can be together all those months. And we reached Bruges eventually during our travels, and Bruges was bustling because of the exhibition. We could only get one room and one bed. So we flipped a coin for the bed, and the one who lost would have to make do with the armchair for the night. And we agreed to share the blankets evenly. We spent the evening at a singing cafe and ended up at a place with beer, and it was late and we were sleepy when we returned to the Grande Vigna. I took our key from its hook in the caretaker's room, and we went upstairs. We chatted for a while, I remember, about the town, the belfry, and how the canals looked a bit like Venice under the moonlight. Then Haldane got into bed, and I settled myself into the armchair. I wasn't very comfortable, but I was quite tired, and I was almost asleep when Haldane woke me up to discuss his will. I've left everything to you, buddy, he said. I know I can trust you to handle everything properly. That's right, I replied. Let's talk about it in the morning, though. He tried to go on about it, and about what a good friend I'd been, and all that, but I stopped him and told him to get some sleep. But no, he wasn't comfortable, he said. And he had a thirst like no other, he claimed. He noticed there was no water bottle in the room. And the water in the jug looks weak, like soup, he complained. All right, I agreed. Go ahead and get some water, for heaven's sake, and let me sleep. But he said, no, you get it. I don't want to get out of bed in the dark. I might, you know, step on something or bump into something that wasn't there when I got into bed. Nonsense, I told him. Nevertheless, I lit the candle. He was quickly out of bed, right beside me. No, he said, I don't want to stay alone in the dark. He said it like a scared child might. All right then, come along, I said. And we went. I tried to crack a joke, I remember, about the length of his hair and the style of his pajamas. But I was quite disappointed. It was almost clear to me, even then, that all my time and effort had been wasted, and that he wasn't better after all. We went down as quietly as we could and fetched a carafe of water from the long, 
empty dining table in the caretaker's room. He got hold of my arm initially, and then he got the candle from me, moving cautiously, covering the light with his hand, and scanning everything carefully, as if he expected to spot something he both desperately wanted and didn't want to see. And of course, I knew what that something was. I didn't like the way he was acting. I can't quite explain how much I didn't like it. He looked over his shoulder from time to time, just like he did that first evening after I returned from India. The situation unnerved me to the point that I could barely find our way back to our room. And when we arrived, I honestly half expected to see what he had expected to see either that or something similar on the rug by the fireplace. But, of course, there was nothing there. I blew off the light and pulled my blankets more tightly around me, I had been trailing them behind me on our little expedition. I was back in my chair when Haldane spoke. You've got all the blankets, he said. No, I don't, I replied. I only have what I've always had. I can't find mine then, he said, and I could hear his teeth chattering. And I'm cold. I? For goodness sake, light the candle. Light it. Light it. Something terrible. And I couldn't find the matches. Light the candle, light the candle, he said, and his voice cracked, like a boy's does sometimes in church. If you don't, he'll come to me. It's so easy for him to come at anyone in the dark. Oh, Winston, light the candle, for God's sake. I can't die in the dark. I am lighting it, I said angrily. I was searching for the matches on the marble-topped chest of drawers, on the mantelpiece, everywhere but the round center table where I had left them. You're not going to die. Don't be silly, I said. It's all good. I'll get some light in a second. He said, it's cold. It's cold. It's cold, three times like that. <coughs> and then he screamed loudly, like a woman, like a child, like a rabbit when the dogs have caught it. I had heard him scream like that once before. What is it? I cried, almost as loudly. For heaven's sake, keep it down. What is it? There was a long silence. Then, very slowly. It's Visker, he said, his voice muffled, as if through a heavy curtain. Visker. I got the candle lit. I moved closer to him. He was huddled at the edge of the bed. On the bed itself lay a lifeless man, pale and very cold. Haldane had passed away in the darkness. It was all so simple. We had entered the wrong room. The room belonged to another man, who was there on the bed he had reserved and paid for before he died of heart disease earlier that day. A French traveling salesman representing soap and perfumes, his name was Félix Leblanc. Later, back in England, I made careful inquiries. The body of a man had been discovered in the Red Hill Tunnel, a salesman of pens for city offices, who had suffered from seizures. He had died from one, it seemed. The bottle of spirit he had drunk remained clutched in his lifeless hand. For my own peace of mind, 
I ensured a police inspector was present when I opened the boxes left to me in Haldane's will. One of them contained a large, sealed box lined with metal, the same box in which I had sent him the skins from India as a wedding gift. The box was tightly sealed. Inside were not animal hides, but the bodies of two men. One was identified, after some effort, as a peddler of pens in city offices who suffered from seizures. He had died during one, it seemed. The other body was unmistakably Visker's. No matter how you try to explain it, I offered you, as you may recall, a choice of explanations before I began the story. Even now, I have not found an explanation that satisfies me.